Father, that that's what you decided to do in your omniscience, is to live in our hearts. But Lord, not just because you didn't have nowhere else better to live, because you came with a purpose and a plan, like we heard this morning. You have a purpose, and you have a plan for each and every one of us. And it starts with this unbelievable power that you have endowed us with to reach your world, to be lights in this dark world, to reach people with the gospel. That's the plan. We all have that plan. We all have that purpose. Father, help us to rise up to the occasion. Help us to use the empower, the power that's within us, Lord, to reach a hurting and dying world with the gift, with the free gift of eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to, to meet the call. And Holy Spirit, I thank you. I thank you so much for all that you do and all that you are. And I just ask once again, Lord, please, Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Nobody needs to hear from me. Please, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. Just want to thank everybody who had a hand in uh, Artie's service yesterday. It was awesome. Um, the helpers, you, you killed it. The dec people who decorated, it's all Yankee stuff all over the place. It was cool. He was an avid Yankee fan. And uh, I just want to... Uh, you know, there's a lot of restaurants in Kingston, but there's one family, the Guido family, that, you know, they own a few restaurants around here, but they're quick to, they're very benevolent. They do a lot of things for the community, and they supplied all the food yesterday uh, for Artie's uh, celebration, and it was, you know, it wasn't like junk food either. You know, it was really good. And uh, I just want to especially thank uh, Mark Guido and, <coughs> and his family for what they do, so... You know, you're looking for a place to go out to dinner? Yeah, maybe Little Italy down the street, man. That might be a good place to go. Let's, let's support them. Amen? <coughs> so I tell you, man, I was thinking about how I, I was trying to think how many sermons that I had preached in my life. I was like, man, it's probably a lot. Probably, a well, I know it's a lot. I mean, a lot. I've preached a lot of sermons, a lot. And I remember in the beginning, you know, it was all about, okay, yeah, we're saved, but we got to get to the meat. You know, we can't be sucking on bottles, drinking milk like little babies. We got to eat steak. And I did that for so long, I can't tell you. You know, I, I, I researched and read and searched and looked and studied and to try to bring new stuff, to try to find the new stuff, you know. And I tell you, after all these years, I come to the realization <laughs> that it's all about Jesus. It just, it's all about him. You know, all the theology, all this stuff, and it's all good because it's in the book. But if you look at it with the right perspective, the whole, the entire Old Testament points to Christ, right? Specifically to the coming Messiah and then he comes and all the awesome theology that Paul, especially, my man, I love that guy. You know, all the awesome, deep, theology that Paul laid on us, it was all like most of it, I kind of look, because it was all about Christ. All of it. All of it's about Jesus. All of it. He's building new churches. He's ministering to new people. He's ministering to people. He's changing people's ideology. He's changing their belief system and their religion. It, it, we made it real deep. Paul didn't make it that deep. He's ministering to mostly, almost entirely, to new believers. And his message is Jesus Christ crucified. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want the title that I put on my sermon is It All Points to Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. So we're, we've been in Acts. We're going to be in Acts for a little while. Great book. We're still writing it, by the way, right? You're in Acts. <laughs> you're, you're in Acts. But in Acts 2, Peter's going to preach the first sermon ever delivered in a Christian church. No other Christian ever preached a sermon other than Christ, I guess. Was Christ a Christian? <laughs> I think so. I think he believed in himself. <laughs> did Jesus believe in himself? Yeah, I think he did. So Peter's getting ready to deliver this first, the first sermon ever preached, right? But he has one point, one point, 
one. Preach Jesus. He didn't get up there like so many of us do. I know I'm very guilty of this. You know, thanks for having me or some kind of jokes or some kind of poems or some kind of family stories or, you know, looking for the opportunity to make fun of the opposite sex or, you know, whatever the heck knuckleheads like me do, right? He just talked about Jesus. That's what he did. Nothing else. Amen? So let's see how this works. You want to see how this works? Because there's a whole lot in here. It's so simple, but yet so profound. That's what I'm finding. Because I have that kind of brain. I like to think that I'm pretty reasonably intelligent and that I have the capability of mining those real buried golden nuggets and find that hidden manna and all that stuff the Word of God talks to. And uh, sometimes I glass over stuff because, you know, I ain't been there. I got that. I got the T-shirt, you know, la, la, la. And I find myself now full circle right back to where it all began and where it should all stay <coughs> because that's the message. It's always been a message. It's never changed. The Holy Spirit is, for, is here for a specific purpose, not to make us feel tingly. The Holy Spirit is here to empower us to reach a world with the gospel. That's why he's here. That's why he's in us. That's what, he, that's what he's all about. He's all about. So let's see how this works. So the Holy Spirit has launched his great work on the earth with power. We talked about that last week, right? Day of Pentecost fell. Bless you. Naturally, naturally, there were skeptics who scoffed. They said the disciples were drinking. You know, that's where all the strange languages came from and blah, 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 right? Now, I don't know about any of you, but I never heard a drunk person telling me the wonders of God in, like, Cantonese or French. Ever. I don't know. Have you? I don't know. Maybe you hang out in different bars than I used to hang out in, but I never heard that. Drunken slurred English does not make someone bilingual. <laughs> it just makes you stupid. <coughs> People who just don't want to believe the gospel, though, even today, still look for rationalizations when the truth is staring them right in the face. It happens all the time. We just don't want to believe what, this, what the word says. We want to try to make it something else. We want to try to believe something else. We want to think, well, it has to be something else. When it's the word, it's not something else. This is what it is. I didn't write it. Nobody in this room wrote it. But we're called by God to be obedient to it. Like it or not. If I don't agree with it, that's my problem. That's all. God says, Frank, I really didn't ask your opinion when I wrote the book. I wrote it without you. But I'm asking you to follow it. But I'm not only just asking you to follow it, I'm empowering you to do it. Right? Because that's, that's the whole thing. Because like we read, nobody could do it. God says, I have a plan and purpose for it. But I, 1 Thessalonians 5.24, but I will make it happen. But you have to do your part, Frank. You have to do your part. So people come up with all kinds of excuses why they don't do what the Word of God says. Or they try to finagle it to say something it doesn't say. Or they, whatever. You, you guys know. So they'll come up with any crazy theory rather than confront the truth that Jesus is real and Jesus is on the move. And his word is contemporary as any book that's ever written today. Amen? Peter sees the smirking, he sees it all, but he steps forward to speak in Aramaic, by the way. He speaks in the language of the people, the language of the Jewish skeptics. And in Luke writes in Acts 2, verses 14 to 36, he gives us the text of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Now, I don't want to look at the whole message, but I encourage you, read it. Read what Peter was saying. Peter, read what he was what he was talking to. The first sermon ever spoken, right? But I want to sum it up, and I'll sum it up this way. Everything that just took place, this is me trying to sum up Peter. <laughs> All right? But I'm going to give my, my best shot. So everything that just took place, from the tongues of fire to the many languages spoken, served to fulfill the prophecy in mainly Joel in the Old Testament. 
So there was many prophecies spoken about this, but those in particular. So this prop so Jesus does all this stuff, and it's, it's, it was spoken of long before he stepped even on the planet, right? In fact, all of the Old Testament prophecies point to Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. Now, they didn't want to believe it. They were staring him right in the face, just like today, no different. The truth is staring him right in the face, but they want to rationalize it. Can't be that. Can't be that. So after Peter finished building an ironclad case for Jesus, read it, being the Messiah, by the way, he aims for the heart of the crowd. Now he's, now he's bringing it home. Peter has one action item on his to-do list. <laughs> one. So listen as he delivers, come to Jesus' invitation with unbelievable, incredible power. I'll read it, and if you want to listen, you can just listen. It's in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 22 and 24. Men of Israel, men and women of Crossroads Christian Fellowship, listen to these words. This Jesus, the Nazarene, was a man pointed out to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan, let me say that again, though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Hallelujah. Awesome. Let's get into this. What's Jesus saying? What's Peter saying? Peter was saying, has Jesus been crucified? Absolutely. Absolutely. But only by the deliberate plan of his father. Nobody, Jesus said it himself, nobody takes my life. I lay it down willingly, right? So nobody crucified him, even though they crucified him. You listening? Deliberate plan of God. This was no setback for him. This wasn't a bad day, even though it was a very bad day for Jesus the man. But this was not God, even though all of hell thought, they all sneered and clapped, and they thought, yeah, we got him. The word of God says that if they only knew, they never would have crucified that guy. They would have stayed clear of him, right? So it wasn't a setback. The cross and empty tomb can be found in the ancient scriptures of every Jew. And they know this. He's talking to them, right? He's talking to the Jews. They know this. A bunch of bad guys may have done the dirty work, but they had no idea they were serving the cause of heaven. They thought they were killing this guy that was starting a bunch of trouble. God's got to forgive me. You got to help me. I got to stop saying crap. That's not a nice word. I say it too much, too. I say it too much. So throw something at me or something. You got to help me stop. Really. I got to stop saying it. It's not. I'm being sincere. I'm not. I'm not being funny. I'm not. I'm not making a joke. I'm being sincere. I shouldn't be. I I shouldn't be saying that. This isn't crap. This is real deal truth. So a bunch of bad guys did the work, but they had no idea they were serving God. Now, I love this passage because it holds two theological views that people tend to set against each other. You ready? These are the two views that so many people set against each other. Number one, the sovereignty of God. And number two, the responsibility of man. See, so often we just blow off our responsibility. Be Well, that's God's plan. No, God's plan is that you we do what the word of God says. So you become a pure and spotless holy bride, that you use the power that I give you, and you spread the gospel. That's my plan. So all the other stuff, that's not my plan. All right? 
my plan wasn't for you to wreck your car because you were drinking. <laughs> or my plan wasn't for you to do any of the other stuff that we do that we try. Well, it's God's plan. It's God's plan. Now, the cross was God's determined plan. The cross was God's, le- now listen to me here. I'm going to say something very important. The cross was God's determined plan, yet lawless people killed him. The cross was God's determined plan, yet lawless people killed him. In other words, God is in control, but men are held responsible. Did you hear what I just said? So when I screw up, it's not the will of God. And it's not his plan. Or, well, I had to do that so in order to get here. No, 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 no. That's God's mercy. That's God's mercy picking my sorry self up and dusting me off and setting me back on path. But that doesn't mean that's his plan. That was not his plan. So God's in control. Is God sovereign? Yes, he's sovereign. He's in control. But men are held responsible. Now that question of seemingly contradictory thoughts has been debated for centuries. But Peter puts those two factors side by side and he lays them right on the table. Right? You with me? The first Christian sermon about Jesus is filled with Old Testament references. Why? There's no New Testament. (laughs) There's no New Testament at this time. None. Zero. None. When Jesus said, search the scripture, you'll find me, there was no New Testament. Right? He's talking about Torah and the prophets. Amen? The Old Testament is filled with prophecies. It's filled with Christophanies. You know what that is? And symbols of Jesus to come. Christophanies is when Jesus showed up. He showed up in the Old Testament, sat and had dinner with, with um, who by the tree, Abraham? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, the New Testament reveals the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies and the life of Christ who came and church, he's coming again. He's returning. From Genesis to Revelation, church, it's all about Christ. It's all about Jesus. Everything is about him. The entire book is about Jesus. He is the beginning, he's the middle, and he is the end. He is the one who binds our Bible together. He is the bridge that that spans the chasm between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He is the word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So you can, we can debate and argue and try to change the word all we want. We could try to go to this grace thing that, well, Jesus is different. No, he's not. He is the book, the whole book, from beginning to end. Amen? amen. You sure you're amen in that? Yes. Okay, amen. Now, I have no idea whether Peter's sermon preparation was anything like mine. I doubt it. I think he was just being moved by the Spirit. I don't think he did the crazy stuff I do. It seemed pretty spontaneous to me, right? Mine takes three or four hours a day for three or four days a week. He kind of just blew that one right out, and he nailed it. He absolutely nailed it. I have to say that especially over the last six months or so, I've learned that whatever the subject or text or occasion, church, all roads should lead to the cross and the empty tomb. I I can't stress it enough, man. And here's a guy who loves theology. I love, love, love it. I love digging up stuff. I love finding things that I think are relevant. I love doing all that. I have spent hours and hours and hours looking at this stuff when Jesus was right there all this time 
staring me right in the face, saying, Frank, I'm it. I've always been it. I'm the answer. I'll save this world. No one else will. In fact, I already did. Help me, Lord. So, we're going to be talking a lot about Jesus. Now, if you have a problem with that, maybe you should go find some theological pastor that will lead you down a different <laughs> road. But that's what I'm saying. And you know what? If it's been good enough for Billy Graham, he was pretty effective. <laughs> I think he had a pretty decent ministry. Still think I should have took it over, but. Jesus is the great subject of all preaching. And Peter already understood this. First Peter, right out of the block. He knew this. He began in Joel in the Psalms, and he ends up at the cross in the empty tomb. Now, you can start anywhere. This is what God told me. Start anywhere, Frank, but there really is only one destination. Pick a book. Start anywhere in the Bible you want. It's all going to lead to the cross. It's all going to lead to the empty tomb. So in structure in his sermon, Peter has followed the simple to-do list with only one action item. Get to the cross. Get to the empty tomb. Because the empty tomb is really the, the whole ball of wax, right? There was one theme. There was one character. So let me ask you something. Is that true in today's church? Is that true in today's church? Is that true in our church? Is that true in the church at large? In many churches, it seems we hear a lot about how to be fulfilled, how to overcome anxiety, how to fix our marriages, how to raise our kids, how to get out of debt, how to live a good life. And yes, the name of Jesus shows up somewhere in the sermon. Because after all, you and I are pathetic humans, <laughs> right? But the message is not really about Christ. It's not about who he is. It's not about what he did. It's not about why he suffered. Why did he suffer? Why would he put himself through that? I mean, he was God. He could have just went. Why? Do you know that? Have you ever asked yourself why? Why did he put himself through that? He didn't have to go through that day. But he did. So why did he do it? Why did he suffer? And what it means that he rose again. What does that really mean? Because it's really all about us. It's really about this incredible love story, man. I told you that. I told Billy in April there. He told us. You remember on my wedding day, eight months, my wife, crazy lady. And that day, she didn't even shed a tear. <laughs> I couldn't stop crying. When she walked through the back of the room, man, I was like, oh, I was, my breath was taken away. I was gone. God said to me, you see, Frank, because I kept telling myself, it's all about the bride. It's all about the bride, Frank. It's all about the bride. It's all about the bride. I said, you see, Frank, it was all about the groom. All them months, all that preparation, all those tears, all that making this dress perfect and this hair and everything was so that your bride can present herself to you, the daughter. That's the story, Frank. That's the story. Yeah, it's all about Jesus all about him but right now it's all about us heaven all of heaven's attention is on us it's magnificent man it's magnificent helping us getting us to that place where we can present ourselves to our groom spotless holy and blameless
Jesus has become just a vehicle leading us to some personal goal, but secondary, secondary to the main event. It's all about the groom. It's all about the groom. I understand the heart behind not coming on too strong. I understand all that. I get it. I do it myself. But with the st state of today's world, we definitely need Christ. We definitely need Christ. We did a service here yesterday for Artie, and I, I prayed about it, and God told me Artie would have wanted me. We had a lot of people here that were not necessarily down with the whole Jesus thing. They heard it yesterday, though. They heard it yesterday. Why? Because this world's going to hell <laughs> right in front of our eyes. And we're called to not let that happen. Help us, Lord. So I understand that. But I'm done understanding it. Seeking to aff effectively fulfill the Great Commission, our church needs to be a relevant biblical community. Let me say that again. This church, Crossroads Christian Church, needs to be a relevant Biblical community, hallelujah. Relevant in the fact that relevant reaches out to the culture. Biblical will impact souls and community, community will connect us to people. Relevant biblical community. Relevant reaches out to culture. Biblical impacts souls, and community connects our people. The church needs to be all three. But we seem to be drifting to building relevant communities short of biblical truth. Let me tell you something. That's a club. That's not a church. That's a club. It's especially not the church that Peter's building. You know, that one that really had an impact on the entire world, that one. Jesus has got to be the center of our message. It has to be the center of our ministry. And when I mean ours, I mean ours. Not just mine up here. Not just what we do here. I'm talking about the people that you come in contact with, the way you live your life, how and where and what you do. The center of it should be Christ. Period. That's what we're called to do. And, and be encouraged. In this whacked out world we live in, God and his omniscience, wisdom, says you're the ones who need to be here. You're the ones he wants to use. I'm the one he wants to use. Now. And he wants me to be relevant now. See, Jesus is relevant. He doesn't go out of date. The Bible's contemporary. It's not for then. It's now. It hasn't changed. One of the nicest and saddest compliments that I've ever gotten, and I've got it a few times, is, man, you really teach the Bible there. Not many other churches do that anymore. I've heard that a few times. That's Sad. That's sad. I'm glad to hear that the message that we share is helpful. But thanking a preacher for t talking about Jesus is like thanking a pitcher for throwing a strike. What else are we supposed to be doing? Jesus is the message, church. He isn't the backdrop. The Bible tells us he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. Now, Peter ends his sermon with a one-item to-do list. He calls for a personal, logical, and heartfelt response to what he just shared. Let's read it. Acts chapter 2. Let's get over there. Come on. I'm going to read verses 37 to 39. Now, if I encourage you to go read it because Peter hits him hard, man. You know, Peter's hitting him, man. 
he's hitting them. Listen, sometimes the Bible stings. Sometimes it's offensive even. That's not our problem, church. That's not our problem. We're not told to lighten it up, make it easy. We're not told to, to you know, try to lead people into a room and then open a window so they can jump out. We're not doing that. We're not called to make up a God in our own head. We're not called to do that. We're called to follow the word of God, right? So verse 37 says, when they heard this, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? And what's he say? He didn't say, oh, it's all right. You know, I'm going to, he says, repent. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Don't think that them two have to happen together. I can go down that. We could talk about baptism is an outward expression of something that's happened inward. This is one thing. Repent. Repent. Each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Hallelujah. Now, isn't that what we're supposed to do? Right? The conviction of sin demands a response. We're not to, to condemn people. We're not to tell them that, you know, you're, you're, everything's wrong and I'm right. That the Spirit doesn't lead us that way. That's not what it's about. Because all condemnation does is push people out the window. Right? Conviction, though, demands a response. That's what Peter's message stirred in these people. So that they wanted to know what? What must we do? So he didn't candy coat the message. He didn't water down the gospel. He didn't water down Jesus. He certainly didn't say, make up one in your own head. He didn't do that. He gave them Christ. Christ and the Holy Spirit brought conviction. Conviction led them to repentance. Hallelujah. What must we do? You see, a great sermon isn't a collection of information. It should be a call to action. When people hear a great sermon, they shouldn't be saying, wow, that's nice. That was nice. Frank, you were good today. And then go, go home without, you know, even talking about it and something else on their mind. If you left here like that, then that sermon stunk. A great sermon should leave you thinking, talking, ready to do something. True preaching will convict. It'll motivate. It'll energize. It will move people to action. No one left Peter's sermon nodding, smiling, picking up where they left off an hour earlier. No one. 3,000 people, by the way, that day. 3,000. The original language for deep conviction, it tells us here, it tells us that these people were cut to the heart. Deep conviction. They were cut to the heart. That needs to be the target of all our ministries. All of us. When we're talking to somebody, when we're spreading the gospel, our plan should be to cut deep into their heart. See, the heart is where our treasure lies. Our heart is where the control panel is. Peter's hearers, they didn't just feel bad. That's not what we're trying to do. They were in deep pain. (laughs) They were in deep pain because they realized for the first time that they had rejected and killed the Messiah. And that caused them deep sorrow that they had to do something. We know people. We've been people who've neglected and rejected the Messiah. Who have made up our own game plan. we have tried to rewrite the word of God to fit our agenda. We've done it. We know a lot of people who've done it. 
as Christians, we can't be afraid to hit people with the truth of God's word. This is these are drastic times. I know people don't like me. But the truth of the matter is they don't like me because I'm easy not to like. It's really God they have the problem with because I'm, I'm trying to tell them the truth. I'm trying to tell them what the word of God says. They want to hear something else. Okay. Okay. You see, guys, if I need a heart, if I need heart surgery, I don't want the surgeon to be afraid to cut close to my heart. I want him to use the scalpel fearlessly to save my life. You know, I've been saying a lot, we got to get in the game. We got to get in the game. We got to get in the game. I'm never saying that again. This ain't a game. We're not in a game. We're in a serious fight. We have an enemy that's trying to do whack out crazy things. People are dying. People are dying every day on our watch. It's time to get serious about that. It's time to pick up our sword, man. Pick it up. Dust it off. The word conviction makes people uncomfortable in the church today. They don't want to hear about conviction. I'm bad. Don't want to hear about that. They love to hear about encouragement. We love that word. Mm, restoration, comfort. We want to hear about blessings. You know, God wants to bless us. We want. We love them words, and it's and they're all true. Yes. I'm not saying them words are wrong. None of them words are wrong. But they're secondary. We want to make them the main thing. They're the secondary thing. Conviction, pastors don't talk much about that. You want to know why? You want to know why? They don't want to scare anyone away. Numbers will go down. Collections will go down. That's why. So, we tell them what they want to hear. Turn the TV on. Watch it. Look at the big places. Look at the churches. Look what they're saying. They don't want to scare any wa- anyone away because the collection plate will suffer. Let's be real honest. So they find themselves telling people what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. And it's funny because the Lord told us that would happen. Where do you think I'm going? Come on, you know. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 5. Let me read this. Because God knew this was going to happen. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ and Jesus Christ who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom, proclaim the message. Now listen, because of his appearing and his kingdom. Now, he's talking to Timothy. Proclaim the message. Persist in it, whether convenient or not. Rebuke, correct, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear something new. Another version says their ears will be itchy, right? They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. Myths. But as for you, be serious about everything. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. And fulfill your ministry. Hallelujah. God knew this was coming. He knew that there was going to be people that wanted to make up. They want want their ears to be tickled, another version says. So they'll surround themselves with people that tickle their ears. I know a lot of people like that. A lot. They'll look every place there is but the Bible to hear what God has to say. We can't abandon our calling. It's time to pick it back up, church. And that is to give people the gospel, the whole gospel. 
the whole gospel, the whole thing. Not just slide. And guys, the gospel's sharp, man. Sometimes it's really sharp. It cuts to the heart. But if we do it, we'll hear people say, what must I do? What must I do? Guys, what God provides is real. What the world provides, what God made up in their own mind, man, that's imitation. That's that ain't even real. Conviction moves people to run to God. Peter's sermon made that happen. The first sermon ever preached. The sword of the spirit cuts to the heart, guys. The goal of biblical preaching, the goal of biblical sharing is not to make people feel guilty or condemned, but to open their hearts to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The final words of Peter's sermon are not only convicting, but they're kind of devastating. Verse 36. Let me get back to Acts. Chapter 2. And verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Imagine how they felt at that point. Imagine. Was he worried about how they felt? Or was he worried about their souls? Was he worried about his, you know, what's the word I'm looking, how popular he was? Or was he worried about them? Imagine how they felt. Those who had the blood of God's son on their hands, by the way. Because they were there. They were there listening to Peter. Same people who said, kill him. They were there. And Peter replies in verse 38, repent. Peter said to them, and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of, the, of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. The Greek word translated repentance is metanoia. It means change mind. That's a better way to determine repentance. Change mind. To repent is to change the way you think about your life and about how you live it, about your behavior, about what you're doing or not doing. It means to change the way you think. Change your heart. Change the direction of your life. And real repentance will see that. That's what happens. If I did anything right in my life, it was early on when I told you earlier, I really, truly repented. And I did the best I could to lay my life down the way I was living it. I tried hard. My wife will tell you. It was hard. A lot of crying. A lot of struggling. A lot. But I wanted, I wanted it. I wanted what God said I could have. But it wasn't just going to fall out of the sky. I had to get it. Diana had a very good word for us this morning, but before she gave it, she says, if you want it, you have to go get it. That was the word. If you want God's blessings, if you want to be used, if you want to fulfill your destiny, you got to go get it. You got to go get it. <laughs> repent is agreeing that God's right and we're wrong. So Peter tells his listeners to repent and reverse the course of their lives. True repentance is humility before God resulting in a change of our thinking that transforms the very core of our living. Repentance means an about face in the way that we've been living. I'm going to turn. It is a turning. But I can't turn unless my mind changes. I have to be convicted here. If I'm not convicted, my actions don't change. I'll keep making excuses up. I'll keep doing the same thing over and over. I'll keep having the same struggles over and over and over and over. It has to be here. Point to your heart. <laughs> has to be here. Our soul. 
Yes, we'll struggle. Yes, we'll be tempted. But we're moving in a new direction. Those who repented after hearing Peter made a complete break, break from their old lives. They left it all behind. To repent doesn't mean that you'll become morally perfect and sinless. That's not what we're talking about here. But it does mean that you will be open to the Holy Spirit's convicting, conviction. And you will be quick to ask God for help in the moment, in the moment, to turn away from sin. In the moment. You see, if I'm, if I'm trying to stay sober, I don't keep going to the bar. And then wonder why I'm not sober. Or blame God, or blame a demon, or blame whatever I want to blame. I have to change the way I think. Mm, maybe I shouldn't go where there's alcohol. Maybe I shouldn't do that. I struggle in that area. Maybe I should just not do that. And then bank on the power that God has given me to just not do that. And that comes in a lot of forms. Staying in fellowship, getting people around us, having people praying for us, having, you know, all the stuff that we're supposed to be doing as a family, as a fellowship. But it all starts here. It all starts here. Hallelujah. To repent doesn't mean that I become morally perfect or sinless, but it does mean that I'm open to the Holy Spirit. Some people in 2023 really imagine a balance scale in heaven. I've talked to so many of them with good deeds on one side and bad deeds on the other side. And if I can just tip this scale with more good stuff than bad stuff, maybe 51% good, man, I'm in. I'm golden. The problem is that God doesn't want 51% church. He wants 100%. He wants 100%. 100% purity. This is why only Jesus, who never sinned, is the only one who can save us. Because there's nobody 100% pure in this room. Right? But we have a Savior. We have a Lord, but he says Lord first, then Savior. It's Lord, Savior, not Savior, and then maybe Lord. It's Lord and Savior. And he has the ability to show me to the Father 100% pure. You can try all you want, guys. You can't do anything to save yourself. You'll never attain perfection, not even for a day. I can't even do it through one of my wife's Bible teachings in the back. I got to open my fat mouth and say something. <laughs> right? So this is why Peter offers a sermon with one call to action, church. Repent in order to accept Christ and be saved. I once heard about a man who felt deeply convicted. Listen to me here. He came forward during Sunday morning worship service to offer himself and a, and, and a prayer of repentance. He went on his knees and his pastor knelt beside him. Lord, the man prayed, remove the cobwebs of sin from my life. His pastor put his arm around the man and said, yes, Lord, and kill the spiders that made the cobwebs. When we pray and repent of our sins, man, let's be sure that we're not only asking God to remove the cobwebs of the sin, but also ask him to kill the spider as well. To remove the sin itself, not just the guilt that we feel from it, because that's what we do so often. We don't want the guilt. We don't really mind the sin. Let's be honest. It's not the sin. It's the guilt. It's the guilt. So what we're really asking God to do is just make me not feel guilty from for sinning. <laughs> It'll never happen. That never happens. Ever. I have to say, Lord, please remove this sin. 
help me not to do it anymore. Got to go because every time I did it, I feel guilty. So Peter, my man, he's awesome. He had one directive. One. What is it? One goal. Not a goal. When you write it, one point. Sorry, one point. One purpose. Repent. And he truly has only one subject and one reason. Jesus. That was it. So here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Because I'm telling you guys, Jesus is the answer to all the big questions. All of them. Every one. Questions about salvation, about Christian living and how to do it, about death, about our problems, about our marriages, about our kids, about everything. He's the answer. Yes, it really is that simple. I'm 100% convinced of it. Even for all us big theologians in this room, Jesus is still the answer. But again, what about the church? People try to make the church a lot of things. They try to make it a political movement, a social justice movement, a personal success and motivational movement, a country club, if you will. I told you there's churches that got Starbucks in their lobbies. Guys, the church is all about Christ, and that's what it should be. And anything else is not church. Anything else is not church. And that should alarm us. That should alarm a lot of us because we see so many churches today that are about everything but Jesus. We see so many Christians today are about all kinds of stuff except Christ and the gospel and what he says. The very reason for the church and for our existence has sort of slipped away as time goes on. But notice Peter's progression. First, Jesus is clearly declared. Then he calls for conviction. Then he calls for repentance. And then he calls for a changed life. That's the way it works. It's not going to change. That's how it works. Maybe the lack of life change in the church needs to be traced back to the lack of Jesus being central. Maybe I should look at my life and wonder why I struggle and realize that, man, maybe I don't have enough Christ. Maybe there's not enough Jesus in my life. Maybe I'm doing every other thing. Maybe I'm looking every other place and not looking in the book. The goal of church is not to make earth a nicer waiting room at the door of hell. Boom. Let me, you want me to say it again? I can say it again. I can say it again. The goal of church is not to make earth a nicer waiting room at the door of hell. Because quite frankly, the church at large, so many people are deceived in church every Sunday. Every Sunday. Tickled ears, surrounding themselves with people who tickle their ears, and they're on their way to hell. And they don't even know it. They're so deceived. You do well to believe. Even demons believe. <laughs> the church exists to reroute us to heaven by way of Christ. That's why we're here. That's our role. We become focused on meeting particular needs. Yes, we're supposed to do that. But if we don't do that through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, we're simply passing time and we're putting on a nice show. And we'll get some acclimates by the community and with everybody else. We're here to show the hope of Christ as a relevant biblical community. That's what we are. That's what we're going to be. That's what we're going to try to become. That's our goal. Let's face it, we all have issues. <laughs> all of us, me included. Whatever they are, Jesus is the answer. It's really that simple. 
It really, really is. The closer I get to him, the better I get to know him, the more he will allow, and the more I allow him to guide my life through the power of the Holy Spirit, the more my issues fade away. And so will yours. Let me just say something, guys, before I close, and I'm closing right here. I certainly don't know everything about Jesus. I'm not claiming to. But he knows everything about me. And he loves me anyway. Did you hear me? And because he loves me so much, I can't help but love him. Why I can obey him when I'm really doing good anyway? It's because I know him. Because I really got to know him. And because I really got to know him, I really understand how much he values me. And because I really understand how much he values, values me, it makes it very easy for me to do what he asks. And because he loves the church so much, I can't help but love the church too. I love the church. I love us. I love this family. It's awesome. It's the best thing. It's the best. There's nothing more I'd rather do on a Sunday morning. Nothing. Take it off. Please, Lord, don't take this. The church, if it's truly and authentically and biblically the church, then the church will be all about him. If you're from a Catholic background, then this is what the first pope preached. If you're from a Hebrew descent, this is what a Jewish fisherman proclaimed. And that is what a father of Jesus did. An eyewitness of the cross. And the first preacher on Pentecost taught us. First, middle, last, and always, our message needs to be Jesus. Amen. 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 Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance to you, and give you peace this day and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.